Welcome back to day 299 of our Bible and Year reading plan. Today we will be reading John chapters 9 through 12. So let's dive into the Word of God. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in a man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do? They asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed. I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why? That's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe. The man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Amen. That is the end of chapter nine. And we see Jesus heal 
this man born blind on the Sabbath, which of course causes an uproar with the Pharisees because they just consider healing as work, which is weird. But, um, and the man is healed. And then we have this dialogue between the man and the Pharisees and them trying to get him to, I don't know what they were trying to do, get him to confess <laughs> something. I don't know. But um, and then Jesus comes and finds the man because the man has been kicked out of the synagogue, which for Jewish people is the center of community, is the synagogue, especially back then. And then we see the man talking to Jesus and believing in Jesus and actually worshiping Jesus. And this is one of the first instances where we actually read that someone worshiped Jesus. And then um, the Pharisees get mad because Jesus told them that they were blind, pretty much. All right, let's go on to chapter 10. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about him. Some said, he's demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? Others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple, walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. The father and I are one. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus replied, It is written in your own scriptures that God said to certain leaders of the people, I say, you are God. And you know that the scriptures cannot be altered. So if these people who received God's message were called God. Why do you call it blasphemy when I say, I am the son of God? After all, the Father set me apart and sent me into the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done. Even if you don't believe me, 
Then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Once again, they tried to arrest him, but he got away and left them. He went beyond the Jordan River near the place where John was first baptizing and stayed there a while, and many followed him. John didn't perform miraculous signs, they remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true, and many who were there believed in Jesus. Amen. That is the end of John chapter 10. And in this passage, we see Jesus talking about him being the good shepherd that lays his life down for the sheep and that the sheep know Jesus's voice and those that know his voice will follow him. And then we see the people trying to stone him again because Jesus says, you know, that he is the son of God. And but to the Jewish people, this is, you know, equating himself with God. And so they want to stone him for blasphemy at this point. Um, and so this is like the second time that we've seen Jesus in the book of John. This is like the second time that we've seen Jesus try to be arrested or stoned by the people. But all right, let's go on to chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she said. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus's grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. 
Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded. And didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Caiaphas, who was high priest at that time, said, You don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it is better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own. As high priest at that time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation, and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. As a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among the people and left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness, to the village of Ephraim, and stayed there with his disciples. It was now almost time for the Jewish Passover celebration, and many people from all over the country arrived in Jerusalem several days early so they could go through the purification ceremony before Passover began. They kept looking for Jesus, but as they stood around in the temple, they said to each other, what do you think? He won't come for Passover, will he? Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must report it immediately so they could arrest him. Amen. That is the end of John chapter 11. We see the miraculous resurrection of Lazarus from the dead and people coming to believe in Jesus because of this miracle that had happened. We also see the Pharisees once again applauding how to kill Jesus because of this miracle and because they fear that if people believe in him that the Roman government is going to come and destroy um, and destroy Israel and destroy their temple for some reason. Um, I'm not really sure why they would do that because Jesus' ministry was for the most part peaceful. Um, but all right, let's go on to John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume made with, from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, Some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging the world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded, we understand from scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the son of man will die? Just who is the son of man anyway? Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Jesus shouted to the crowd, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. I don't speak on my own authority. The father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the father tells me to say. Amen. That is the end of chapter 12. And at the beginning of this chapter, we see Jesus being anointed by um, Mary. And they told us before that she was the one that anointed um, Jesus with her hair. And then um, we also see the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We get a little more detail about that um, because when we read it and the other ones, they say that, you know, everybody's saying Hosanna and things like that. In this chapter, it also tells us that they were saying hail to the king of Israel, which would have caused trouble because, you know, there was only one king at the time and the Roman government would not have approved of that. Um, and then we also see Jesus predicting his death and saying, you know, that he has to be lifted up and that he must die. 
And then we hear about the people that don't believe in Jesus and that this was prophesied in Isaiah, that even despite everything that Jesus did, his miraculous signs, that they still did not have faith in him. But all right, that is the end of day 299 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. I pray that you are blessed by this reading. Don't forget to check out the reflection questions in the description section of the video and to like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. All right, everyone, have a blessed day. Bye.